We'll call the meeting to order, please. There we go. Speak softly and carry a big stick. Call the meeting to order. Um, this is our regular meeting, um, number 21 of the 95-96 fiscal year. May we have the roll call by the town clerk, please? Chairman Cogsall. Here. Council Chapel. Here. Yep. Council Jordan. Here. Yep. Council Linnell. Here. Council McGinty. Here. Council McLaughlin. Here. Council Reed. Here. If you'd all join us in the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> Good night. Grant Quartz. Um, we have citizens' discussion of items not on the agenda. Is there anyone who wishes to come forth and make a statement? There being none, we'll have reports and correspondence. Madam Chairman. Yes, Mr. Chapel. The uh, bring you up to date on regional waste services. The we've had quite a month since our last board meeting. We've been out there for five different meetings. On 424, we had an 8 a.m. Finance Committee meeting and 425, 5 p.m. Executive Committee and 7 p.m. Board meeting. 5-1, another Finance Committee. 5-7, a Finance Committee. And another one this Wednesday night. And then Thursday night, we'll finally get to the final vote on the budget. It's been quite a job, as I've been telling you for a year on flow control, what it's done to us. Brought us from $68 a ton of commercial waste down to $40 that we've authorized the manager to except at the plant. All commercial waste we're taking in at $40 a ton. We've created quite a havoc, you might say, in the waste business in that we are, have a tipping fee for the commercial haulers that's the lowest in the area. We're getting swamped with waste at the present time, which is good. We may suffer for it this summer and have too much, but that would certainly be different than having too little. We can always put some of it away in our landfill and get it ready for next year. We're going to try it for two months and see how it works. We're determined that we're going to win this thing and bring it back where the 31 communities that own RWS are not going to get hit in the teeth every year with advanced tipping fees and assessments. So uh, bear with us, and I'll have a final report for you after Thursday night of this week. Thank you. Other reports and correspondence? Council Linnell. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I just wanted to say that uh, Wednesday the 22nd, Public Advocate Stephen Ward uh, will be here at the Cape Elizabeth Middle School uh, for an informal presentation on the restructuring of the electric utility industry. And uh, it'll be very informative, free, and there'll be homemade uh, Linnell-made desserts uh, uh, as long as they last. Any other reports or correspondence? Councillor <coughs> McLaughlin. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I do want to say to my fellow councillors, I did miss you last month. Most people know I was out of the country. I was on a very wonderful opportunity sponsored by Rotary International and spent four weeks with four other people from this Rotary district in Buenos Aires, Argentina. The council has an edible souvenir from that visit. I want to thank you for carrying on without me while I was gone. I maybe missed you more than you missed me <laughs> some days and look forward to sharing with you some of the information I picked up and give you a brief insight into the political process in Argentina. I missed the council meeting last month but I do have minutes from a council meeting in Argentina to prove that I was there and did speak in Spanish. Any other comments or reports? Okay, I want to um, congratulate Barbara Ray, who is Michael's secretary, who just reached her 10th anniversary in service to the town, and to announce that on this uh, Wednesday evening here in the town hall will be the first public forum on the complete redraft of the zoning ordinance, the Zork um, committee report. Everyone is welcome. Um, it's been a long process of over 19 months and at least two meetings a month. So we are 
very eager to hear comments, um, hopefully complimentary comments, <laughs> and um, we're ready to take any criticism also. So that's open to the public. Um, Debbie, you want to make a report on the elections? Thank you. Just very quickly, uh, last Tuesday was a municipal election. We had a 24.2 percent voter turnout, or 1,898 votes were cast. We had five run for two seats on the council. Joseph Groff uh, was successful with 946 votes. Rosemary Reed, the incumbent, 925. Carol Fritz, 847. Jim Clark, 729. And Robert Tripler, 117. For school board, we had three run for two seats. The incumbent, Beth Curry, was, was successful with 1324. George Entwistle will be joining the school board with 1048. And James Hughes also ran with 903. Um, those folks will take office on June 10th, which is next month. Thank you. I also want to thank all the candidates who ran. It was an exciting election. Um, it's the kind of election we like to see where there is a good discourse on different issues, and congratulations to all those who have won. I also want to say tonight that this is the final formal meeting for Irv Chapel. Irv has um, had a very long career of service and dedication. He has been with us, I believe this is five years. And he has um, been one who's always stepped forward to serve um, his family, his church, his country, and always his community. He um, has served the community for being um, 25 years as the director of emergency preparedness right up to his last advocacy, as he told you tonight, with um, working very hard for the town and small towns <clears throat> on the regional waste systems. Um, we certainly, you have brought an interesting dimension and a very educated dimension to the council. I've enjoyed working with you and I'm sure all the other councils had. We didn't always agree on all the issues, but we certainly had a good discourse and any decisions were better because of it. I wish you well in your new career as a budding artist. It's a love and interest he shares with his bride Priscilla of 50 years and they are having a wonderful exhibition over at the Thomas Memorial Library for you all to see and enjoy. So thank you for your dedication again, Irv, and I know if we need any help from you, you'll always step forward to help. Thank you. On to the minutes of meetings number 19 and number 20. Do we have any additions or corrections in these minutes? If not, I'll take motion that they be accepted. So moved. Second. All in favor? That is. I've seen. Okay. It's a 6 0. We will begin now our public hearings on the budget the general fund budget, sewer fund budget, Riverside Cemetery fund budget, Portland Headlight. <laughs> Fund Budget, Spurwing Church Fund Budget, Fort Williams Park Capital Budget, and Michael would like us also to do the public hearing on the parking in Little John Road. I think I'd like to reserve that for after the budget so we can focus on the dollars. Um, does our finance chairman, John McLaughlin, have any comments you want to make before we begin comments on the budget? I want to offer very sincere thanks to the town's department heads, to the town staff, the town manager, the manager's secretary who always has a marvelous task of putting our budget documents together, to the school board and the school department for all the very hard and dedicated work that they put into the budget process this year. We asked a lot of you in many different ways. You produced a very useful document, Mr. McGovern. I personally thank you. I know how much I harassed you some days, and it was not always easy. And we were changing the format. That's a very large undertaking. I'm hoping that everybody felt that we're taking steps in the right direction with our budget format. Um, our process was a bit different, and I'm, again, very thankful to those of you who had to bear with us and kind of go through the learning curve as we were trying to decide what we wanted from you. 
I'm very pleased to announce that the hard work did culminate while I was away, which made it even nicer <laughs> on my part. Thank you all. And hope that the citizens will respect the hard work that has been accomplished. We're very open to questions at this point. I know it seems a bit awkward to some to have the questions come now when the process is just about finalized, but we did have citizens with us during the day. It was in March on a Saturday where we did have a, practically a day-long budget discussion, and there was very good publicity thanks to the Cape Courier. Other than that, I think it would be wonderful to hear from anybody who wants to speak, and then we will get on with our motion. Is there anyone who wishes to make a comment on any of the, the budget overall or any particular segments of the budget? There being no one, um, I'll close this part of the public hearing and we'll move on to item number 142 to consider comments um, on the fiscal year 1997 general fund budget and take any necessary action. Council McLaughlin. I'd like to make a motion so we can open this for discussion. Be it ordered that the Cape Elizabeth Town Council, having held a public hearing on Monday, May 13, 1996, is hereby adopt the municipal budget for fiscal year 1997 with gross expenditures of $17,768,055 and gross revenues of $5,383,866 and with the amount of $12,000,000 $384,189 to be raised by taxation and does further fix Friday, October 4th, 1996 and Friday, April 4th, 1997 as the dates upon each of which one half of such tax is due and payable with interest to accrue upon taxes due and unpaid after each such date at the rate of 10% per annum. Do you want all of the budget items or individual? Well, they're separate of, as items on the agenda, so why don't we proceed that way? Okay. A motion, please. The rest of the language is basically boilerplate in this motion. It goes on to parts B, C, D, E, F, and G. And if anybody in the office is interested, there are copies on the back table. This is, again, boilerplate as we are. Um, required by the state to list. Motion. The motion would be to approve the item as presented in the council packet. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? All those in favor? To 7-0. Item number 143, to consider public hearing comments upon the proposed fiscal year 1997 sewer fund budget and take any necessary action. Council McLaughlin. Madam Chairman, I would move that it be ordered that the Cape Elizabeth Town Council, having held a public hearing on Monday, May 13, 1996, is hereby adopt the fiscal year 1997 budget for the sewer fund with expenditures of $1,360,477 and gross revenues of $1,410,027. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? That is a 7-0. Item number 144, to consider public hearing comments upon the proposed fiscal year 1997 Riverside Cemetery Fund budget and take any necessary action. Council McLaughlin? I would move that it be ordered that the Cape Elizabeth Town Council, having held a public hearing on Monday, May 13, 1996, does hereby adopt the fiscal year 1997 budget for the Riverside Cemetery Fund with expenditures of $9,929 and gross revenues of $29,000. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? That's a 7-0. Item number 145 to consider um, comments upon the proposed fiscal year 1997 Portland Headlight Fund budget and take any necessary action. Council McLaughlin. Thank you. I would move that it be ordered that the Cape Elizabeth Town Council, having held a public hearing on Monday, May 13, 1996, is hereby adopt the fiscal year 1997 budget for the Portland Headlight Fund 
with expenditures of $252,806 and gross revenues of $297,100. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? It's a 7 0. Item number 146 to consider public hearing comments upon the proposed fiscal year 1997 Spurwink Church Fund budget and take any necessary action. Council McLaughlin. Thank you. I'd move it be ordered that the cable is with Town Council having held a public hearing on Monday, May 13, 1996. is hereby adopt the fiscal year 1997 budget for the Spur Spurwink Church Fund with expenditures of $5,028 and gross revenues of $8,950. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? It's a 7 0. Item number 147 to consider public hearing comments upon the proposed fiscal, fiscal year 1997 Fort Williams Capital Park Capital Budget and take any necessary action. Council McLaughlin. Thank you. I would move it be ordered that the cable is with Town Council, having held a public hearing on Monday, May 13, 1996, is hereby adopt the fiscal year 1997 budget for the Fort Williams Park Capital Fund with expenditures and revenues of $27,000. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? That's a 7-0. And that completes the, um, the budget items. I do want to say that there is an approximate tax rate to um, the residents of 1856, which is a drop from the previous year. Um, also that I want you to know that the town council is still considering, still receiving its 1967 salaries of $350 a year. So we're doing our own part um, and keeping the, the um, expenses down. So now we'll open the public hearing on um, Little John Road parking. Mr. McGovern. Yes, this item first came before the town council about a month ago when the town council received a petition from residents in the area asking that we no longer post the area, no parking from May 1 to October 1. Uh, it was reviewed uh, with the chief of police as well as with the director of public works and we determined uh, that we could effectively uh, take care of the situation during those times when we knew there were a lot of cars going to be coming by putting temporary uh, emergency no parking signs on uh, small wooden stakes to be removed after the event and that uh, you could would recommend that you repeal the current language in the ordinance providing that from May 1 to October 1 uh, no vehicles should be parked on the southwestern southwesterly side of Little John Road and Shore Road to Robin Hood Road proposed to repeal that language also there, there was a concern expressed by the, the resident on the immediate intersection about cars blocking the intersection and uh, there already is a provision even after this might be repealed uh, that there be no parking within 20 feet of an intersection 30 feet of a stop sign because of that we would post uh, the home immediately in front at the intersection actually on both sides of the street uh, no parking he had a corner signs uh, just up a few feet from the driveway uh, at the upper end of the driveway Thank you. And this refers to um, the ordinance language section section 13.2.2 R5. Yes, and I did meet with the resident on the corner who has expressed some concern on this issue from time to time. And they didn't. They did indicate that this was acceptable. Are there any comments on this um, particular change in the ordinance? If anyone would like to come forward and give their name and address to the microphone. Philip St. Little John Road. I just want to say thank you because I felt that it was unnecessary to have a sign on the homes further in on Little John. And, and one other suggestion is maybe to have a no parking hit a corner on the southeasterly. I don't know what you'd call the other opposite from where you're planning on posting that because there are cars for the Little League that do park immediately right there on the corner which makes a turn off of Shore Road onto Little John difficult to maneuver. You know, if you want to keep that whole beginning open there, that might be something you might, I don't know, 
I don't want to open up you know, arms. <laughs> I'm very grateful that you know you've um, heard my uh, concern. So that's all. Thank you. Right. Thank, Thank you for coming, Michael. Did you say that you were going to post that on both sides? Yeah, I'm not going to the Department of Public Works. Is you will oversee it. That's right. Okay. Any other comments from the public? There being none, um, I'll close the public hearing. We'll move on to item number 148 to consider public hearing comments regarding a proposed amendment to the traffic regulations regarding parking on Little John Road and take any necessary action. Councilor Reed. Madam Chairman, <clears throat> I move that we accept the proposed amendment to the traffic regulations regarding parking on Little John Road and that we, we repeal the language in section 13-2-2R5. Do you want the specific language being repealed? You can say as presented if you want, whichever you want. You can say as presented or as you can presented. read it. And then I present? <laughs> okay, the language in um, Section 5 says, From May 1st to October 1st, no vehicle shall be parked on the southwesterly side of Little John Road from Shore Road to Robin Hood Road. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? That's a 7-0. On to item number 149, to consider a request to approve a British car show at Fort Williams Park on September 8, 1996, and take any necessary action. Mr. McGovern? Yes, thank you, Madam Chairman. The Fort Williams Advisory Commission reviewed this at their April 25th meeting and recommended that you, you once again approve the use of Fort Williams for this British classic auto show. They had had it there a number of uh, prior years. They tried out another location last year, and they've decided they're totally enamored of Fort Williams Park and wish to return to Fort Williams Park. Thank you. Are there any comments from anyone? I'll take a motion. Councilor Reed. Madam um, Chairman, I move that we accept the recommendation of the Fort Williams Advisory Commission and, and approve the British Car Show at Fort Williams on September 8, 1996 and a rain date of September 15, 1996. Discussion? All in favor? That's a 7-0. On to item number 150. To consider a request from Cape Elizabeth High School to hold the 1996 graduation exercises at Fort Williams Park on June 7, 1996. Mr. McGovern? Yes, the class uh, made this proposal to the committee. It was also reviewed April 25, 1996, and the Fort Williams Advisory Commission unan unanimously recommends its approval. Take a motion. Madam Chairman, I move that we follow the recommendation of the Fort Williams Advisory Committee Commission and approve holding Cape Elizabeth High School graduation exercises at Fort Williams Park on June 7, 1996. Sorry. <coughs> Discussion? Councilor Reed. Um, could we indicate that the graduation is at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, or is that not necessary? They need it for all day. All those in favor? The 7 0. <coughs> <coughs> Item number 151 to consider a report from the Fort Williams Advisory Commission regarding a proposed group use policy and take any necessary action. Mr. McGovern? Yes, thank you, Madam Chairman. The Fort Williams Advisory Commission originally asked for this uh, to be looked at about a year ago. Uh, subsequently, they looked at three or four drafts of the proposal. Uh, this final draft represents uh, a, a concerted effort working with the staff to uh, codify a lot, of the, a lot of the existing policies relating to uses within Fort Williams Park. It also, I think in particular, uh, what is new about it is that it has criteria for recommended denials so that you know if there is a use of proposal that comes forward before there was the committee really didn't or the commission really didn't have a list to look down through uh, as to what it ought to be considering in order to say no there's now a, uh, a proposed list there's also specifically a list of uh, different information that would be requested from applicants for the use uh, the fee proposal uh, just isn't changed at all from the past for these group-type outings. Uh, school outing policy has not changed. 
uh, filming and advertising activities uh, indicates that it is permitted, uh, that you do need to obtain permission. Uh, and beyond that, it's uh, essentially the existing policy. Councilor Jordan. Well, you figured I had something to say? You were, you were starting to posture, yes. I just wanted to point out one thing as I read through this on the school outings. And as I interpret that and could read into it, that it could mean any school. It doesn't say anything particularly about cables with schools. Is that the intention? Yes, that is the intent. Okay, good. I'll take a motion on this item. Councilor Reed. Um, Madam Chairman, I move that we accept setting for public receive we receive the Fort Williams Advisory Commission report and that we set to public hearing at the June tenth, nineteen ninety six meeting. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, sorry. It's at 7.30, just to complete. Pardon me? It's at 7.30 p.m. At 7.30 p.m. There's a second. Discussion. Councillor McKinty. I'm wondering if we might want to have a workshop on this rather than go straight to a public hearing. We might want to talk about this amongst ourselves before having a public hearing. If we consider it to be such an issue, I mean, the, the reason for the public hearing because of such great interest in Fort Williams. We might want to sit down and talk about this in a workshop before we bring to the public. Councilor Reed. Uh, Madam Chairman, at the May 25th um, workshop, aren't we discussing in part the Fort Williams uh, Park and the potential for fees? We're, we're um, setting, we're going to very briefly discuss but primarily set a date for um, an open, a public forum relating to fees at the fort. Would you want this to be involved in that whole meeting? I think it's appropriate. Sure. And still have the public hearing in June to get public comment then? I have no problem sure. with the public meeting in June. Public hearing Do you want? To, did you want to say something, Councilor? Just as, lo as long as we do have an opportunity. I mean, if we're going to have a public hearing to accept public comment. That's fine, and then not take final action until after we've had an opportunity to sit down and talk about it. We can. You can read it that way. Okay. Councilor Linnell, your. That sounds fine. We can. We can talk about it the twenty. Twenty. At the 20th. Uh, now, do we need to mo do we need to amend that motion to say that we'll workshop work session it? It would be complete if you did that. Okay. Would you? Yes, I'll amend the motion to include the discussion at the May 20th workshop. I'll amend my second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Seven zero. Do you have all that? Did you okay. <coughs> Item number 152. To consider the award of a bid to close the brush and demolition area in the Cape Elizabeth Refuge Disposal Area and take any necessary action. Mr. McGovern, sorry. Yes, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, first of all, I want to explain that closing is a term that the DEP uses, and that is, is a term that uh, has caused some confusion. We are still going to be taking brush and demolition area Dem brush and demolition material at the refuse disposal area. What we're closing is the old landfill where this used to go. Uh, as part of this bid, what we'll be doing is creating drop-off areas for all of these materials that are uh, very people user-friendly in terms of their ability to unload, uh, that are very easy to get to, that are well signed, uh, and that uh, are pro proper in terms of environmental controls. Uh, we have work, been working on this project uh, for about 10 years now. It's, it's gone on for quite a while. Uh, we have been working very closely with the DEP, with our, with our engineers and with others. Uh, we finally uh, did put the project out to bid. Uh, we received two bids. One was from uh, Shaw Brothers. The second was from R.J. Grondon of Gorham. The low bid was from R.J. Grondon for 456000 Seven hundred ninety-one dollars. 
our engineer on this project, Wright Pierce Engineers, has uh, reviewed the RJ Grandin bid and uh, has reviewed their capabilities and does recommend that uh, it be awarded to RJ Grandin. Uh, the overall project budget would include the amount of the base bid, a 10% construction contingency of 45600 uh, there's a small land purchase involved in this that was approved by the council a couple of meetings ago, $2,500. Uh, construction engineering, $25,000. The great bulk of that is for testing that needs to be done in compaction uh, that's required by the DEP. It will be an outside laboratory. It will not be for having anyone on site monitoring. Uh, to pave the remainder of Denison Drive, which is the road that the refuse disposal area entrance road so that it is paved all the way from Sperling all the way into the point of the new paving, which was not part of this contract. It, it's, uh, so it is one good, clean coat of paving on all of it. Uh, new signs and all the other little things that come up when you work on a project like this, $10,000. The total equals $549,891. Uh, previously, the council appropriated uh, a little bit over $300,000 uh, of that, after the engineering that's been done up to this point and some appraisals and some legal fees, uh, the balance in that account is 283220 uh, From the very beginning of the year, we had discussed putting the overlay balance from this year into this account. Uh, you can recall that. That amount is 200000 And that leaves a balance of $66,671 from undesignated surplus. Um, Truly pleased that we are able to do a project of five and a half million dollars with a lot of planning over the years uh, that have, will enable us to do it without any borrowing and uh, as you've just adopted the budget earlier without a tax increase. Uh, there is uh, one other issue that's still pending in this matter. Uh, we filed a DEP permit on February 14, 1995, uh, a little more than a year ago. At 10 minutes of 5 this afternoon, the DEP uh, indicated to me that they have a, an issue of concern with stormwater runoff. Uh, it, it sounds like something that, that may need to be addressed, uh, but nonetheless, they, in speaking with Barb Sch uh, Schwentner at the DEP, she had no, current, no concerns at all with moving forward at this point and she was preparing a draft order indicating that that would need to be addressed. Essentially what it is, is that the engineering details that had gone to the DEP indicated that there would be some excess water runoff, stormwater runoff uh, at peak times and under the DEP rules they require that we address all of that on site. Uh, she, interestingly for another Greater Portland community, <coughs> just in the last two weeks is in the same situation we are with, with that particular situation in terms of excess stormwater runoff. Uh, I'm not too sure of the exact amount of the cost. We did have that same issue with the school project, having to build a stormwater detention basin. Uh, that ended up being around $45,000. Uh, so I, you know, I mentioned all this. We would like to move ahead on the project since we have a better, since we have a very good bid. Uh, and because we'd really like to get this going through all the bankings and everything are sufficiently seeded uh, prior to uh, the heavy rains in the fall. So I would uh, ask that you award, you authorize me to award the bid, uh, you uh, approve the project funding, and that you, you do it with the understanding that I may be back at you at some point to discuss uh, stormwater detention. <coughs> The motion. Councilor Lanau. Oh, can I get a way of saying so moved? Do you want to hear it all? You want to hear it all? Uh, Debbie, if he said that, you're all set. She's all set. A second? Second. Discussion. Councilor, um, excuse me, Janet. That's a good one. Yeah. See? It's all these M's down there. That's right. I just want you be a little bit redundant with what the manager said, but to emphasize the fact that the council has been working very, very long time on this issue. We've had some extremely concerned citizens, especially those who are do small contract jobs in this community. 
and take brush and demolition materials to the transfer station. I know it's been backbreaking for them to have to unload up into the dumpsters, and I know they've been hearing from us for over a year. Yes, it's going to improve. Yes, it's going to improve. And they kind of shook their heads and scratched their heads. Now it really is going to improve. We're on our way, and I'm as thankful as the next person, and I'm glad to see that those folks will have an easier time. Councilor Reed. I just would like to add emphasis um, and thanks that this project is being accomplished without additional bonding and without a tax increase. And I think that the council and the manager should be um, uh, applauded for the planning and the reserving that's been done to accomplish this goal. Any other comments? Councilor Jordan. Yes, I just have one concern about it, and I take it that the manager and the business have reviewed this. This two hundred thousand dollars difference between the two bids, and the low bid uh, is about two hundred thousand dollars less. And you have reviewed this and feel that we're going to get what was asked for to complete this project, because that's quite a difference out of a. Uh, 400,000 or 600,000 was the top from four to six to me in that small appear, but maybe being a farmer, we don't understand it, but it, those numbers to me add up in quite a different interval. In the almost 18 years I've been working for the town, this is the widest variance we have had on a bid, and when there's only been two bidders. I've, I've never seen 200 and $18,000 separating two bids. Uh, Greg McVeigh, our engineer on the project, was, was very careful to go over the bid with Ken Grondon at RJ Grondon to be sure that everything was included, that there weren't any errors. It would appear you know, that it's one of two things, that it's, that it's two things, it's both of two things. Uh, one is that uh, Grondon has better suppliers in term in terms of some of the material that's required. Uh, there's a lot of material required in this project for uh, clay-like material as well as loam. Uh, the, if you remember when we met with the, the very severe requirements uh, for the, the cover material in the old dump. Uh, two, I think, is, is the fact that uh, uh, there have been a number of bids, and a lot of these contractors have work lined up through the season. And some of them are uh, less hungry to get work now than, than other contractors. And my sense is Shaw Brothers might, might be pretty well set for the summer, and Grondon is still scratching around looking for some more work to fill in the rest of the construction season. Uh, we have worked with Grondon on a number of projects in the past, and they have had a superlative performance with, with every contract we've ever worked with them on. Uh, they recently did a, a reconstruction of a portion of Sawyer Road. Uh, they did all of the site work on the school grounds and, uh, you know, did everything uh, really without incident and without problem. And you know, the issues, uh, you know, you've just seen them over there this week, uh, cleaning up some of the issues there per the contract and per our understanding. They're, they're a good outfit, and uh, I, was, I was pleased to see that they continued to sharpen their pencil and wanted to continue to work in Cape Elizabeth. I don't doubt what they could outfit. I, that isn't the reason I question it. I question the difference in the two figures, figuring somebody might have left out something that it might have been revealed. And you're speaking of what was done over to the school recently, and uh, it looks like it's pretty flat and come out pretty good, but you ride by that with the water that was laying there just a couple of days ago, and you can see some pockets. And to me, as all the time, I always feel Mother Nature in the water will tell you whether it's level or not. I don't go for this, but I just want you all to understand, to make sure that we aren't coming back at a later date for something to carry it through. And that's the point I was trying to make clear is we, I may be back for some stormwater detention issues. I understand that part, too. I got a note right here. Any other comments? I guess I have a concern over why it took the DEP 15 months to finally come back to us that we needed to deal with stormwater when it was evident that there was a problem 
And in the preliminary engineering, did the engineer address that at all so we have some idea of how we would deal with it? What he did was file all of the storm water calculations and it showed there was excess runoff. He apparently was unaware of the requirement that the DEP would, would require us to address that. And certainly, you know, until quarter or five today, there was absolutely no indication that we would be required to address that. It, he, the DEP woman I didn't mention earlier, but the town of Yarmouth is in the exact same situation. Uh, I, I can't, I'm not going to defend the DEP. Uh, well, 15 that was your question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No. Councillor Linnell. Yes, I'm, I'm curious, a uh, question from the manager. How many bids did we have? Was it, was it just two? Or there? Yeah, we had, I believe, seven bid packages go out, only two submitted bids. Okay. Thank you. Any yeah. other comments? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I think we had six show up for the pre-bid conference. And it was advertised. It wasn't just a select bid list, but there was an ad in the newspaper. Thank you. Any other comments? If not, all those in favor of this motion? It's a 7-0. And when will construction begin, Michael? It would begin in mid-June. Item number 153, to consider the elimination of the Town Historical Advisory Committee and instead seek advice on historic matters from the Preserva Cape Preservation Society and take any necessary action. Council McLaughlin, I believe this is something that was initiated some time ago. Would you like Thank to give some background, please? This is a bit of a holdover from days past when I was chairman of the appointments committee. We do move slowly sometimes, but we like to do things properly and make sure we touch base with all the appropriate people. It became evident over the years that we were having fewer and fewer citizens in this town apply to become members of our town-appointed um, historical advisory committee, and that did provoke us to concern. The manager and I sat down, I think it was about a year ago, with representatives of the town historical advisory committee and representatives of the Cape <coughs> Elizabeth Historical Preservation Society had a discussion with them about our concerns, the fact that we were interested in possibly eliminating what is proposed um, before the council tonight, the town appointed board, and having the independent citizen group known as the Cape Elizabeth Historical Preservation Society take over to some extent some of the responsibilities we had been looking to the town appointed board to undertake. They went through a good thought process. They've had meetings about it, they being the Historical Preservation Society. The Council has before it tonight a letter dated March 14, 1996, from Elizabeth Peterson, who at that time was president of that society. I would like to read it, part of it for you and for the audience and the public. It says that unanimously it was voted that, quote, we agree to review any requests from the town manager relative to work to be done on historic buildings or sites in the town and will report to the town council who has the sole authorization to act upon such advice as we might give. This committee, the society has done a lot of work over the years. They maintained the records in the room in the basement of the library. They put on programs. This is the group in town of people who are genuinely interested in historical preservation. They are extremely knowledgeable, and I am very comfortable making the recommendation before the council tonight. The manager, I want to thank for his good work and perseverance on this. I said it has been a bit lengthy, but we wanted to make sure that we were touching bases as was appropriate. And there are representatives from the Historical Preservation Society in the audience this evening. If there are any questions from the council, and I would encourage the council to go along with the recommendation to the point that I would make a motion that we eliminate the town appointed historical advisory committee and instead seek advice on historic matters from the Cape Elizabeth Historical Preservation Society as they outlined in their letter of 14 March 1996. So a second. Discussion. Is there anyone who would like to make a comment?
My name is Robert Lee, and I'm the current president of the Cape Elizabeth Historic Preservation Society. And also present tonight is the immediate past president, Elizabeth Peterson, and Jane Jordan, who's another past president. Together, they have a wealth of knowledge and experience in the society that I do not have. They're there every Thursday. Uh, the office is open from 9 to 12, and they're doing research and filing and cataloging and all that type of thing that goes on and is necessary. We responded to the uh, letter that the town manager sent to us, which was dated uh, 30 January, and the essence was in the second paragraph, and I quote, I envision that the society would occasionally be asked if they were willing to review a certain proposal or help on a project of an historic nature. Any such request would be only a request. The society would then determine if you wish to assist with the project, unquote. And then the, uh, the board considered that and came up with a motion which was presented to the full membership at its March meeting and voted on that motion and uh, Janet just read that motion. So in essence, we're saying that we're more than willing to consider anything the town council wishes us to consider pertaining to the historic preservation of sites or projects in the community and based on our limited resources, both financial and uh, personnel, uh, we would try to accommodate the council and in any event we'd come back with a response stating what we felt we could do to meet that request. Okay, thank you. Discussion? I'll take a so then, you have a motion. We have we have a motion. Oh. All those in favor? That's a seven zero. Thank you very much for offering to assist. On to item number 154, to consider a proposed amendment to the personnel code regarding group life insurance and take any necessary action. Mr. McGovern? Yes, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, the language that's before you this evening is to bring the provision in our personnel code dealing with the main state group life insurance uh, into conformance with current practices. Uh, this is uh, insurance that is paid for by the employees, uh, not, not at all by the town, until such time that the employees retire. And then the premiums are picked up by the town, as, as, as they always have been. Uh, the only employees who are eligible to participate in this particular program are those that belong to the Main Street Retirement System prior to July 1 of 1990. Uh, other employees are not. Uh, on Retirement on pension, the employee's contribution ceases, as I mentioned, and the, light, the life insurance, but not the accidental death and dismemberment portion of the insurance, continues on a reducing basis, uh, declining at the rate of 15% per year until it is reduced to 25% of the average amount, average as defined by the Main Street Retirement System, or $2,500, whichever is greater, and that amount of life insurance remains in force until death. So this simply brings the personnel code into conformance uh, with the provisions at the Main State Retirement System that govern uh, the Main State Group Life Insurance Program. I have a motion. <coughs> Councilor Reed. Um, Madam Chairman, I move that we amend the personnel code so that it complies with the current policy governing group life insurance for the Main State Retirement System, specifically Section 3-2-9, Main State Group Life Insurance. Employees hired on a full-time basis prior to July 1st, 1990 were eligible to participate in the Main State Group Life Insurance and Group Accidental Death and Dismemberment Plan, provided they signed up for the plan prior to July 1st, 1990. The plan is offered through the Main State Retirement System. Employee contributions are determined by the insurer. The life insurance coverage for an employee is the amount for the next round $1,000 above the employee's pay. If death is accidental, the benefit is double the amount of coverage. Benefits are also payable in the case of accidental loss of hands, feet, or eyes. Upon retirement on pension, the employee's contribution ceases on the life insurance, but not the accidental death and dismemberment insurance continues on a reducing basis at a rate of 15% per year until it is reduced to 25% of the average amount as determined by the Main State Retirement System or $2,500, whichever is greater. Which amount, whichever is greater amount remains in force until death. Second. Discussion. Mm -hmm. Council McGinty. 
Uh, how many employees are we talking? About? Fifteen to twenty. There, there are more employees in this than, than are in the Main Street retirement system because when some of the employees got out of the Main Street retirement system, they were able to stay in this. And also, was this reviewed by the Personnel Advisory Committee? Yes, it was reviewed on two occasions, uh, it, it, including this morning. And this particular language was specifically reviewed with them. Okay, and, and they are, uh, they do approve of this? Yes, they do. Any other discussion? All those in favor of the amendment is proposed. That's a 7 0. And item number 155 to consider a proposal to offer to employees the Maine Municipal Health Trust point of service plan as an optional alternative to the current Maine Municipal Health Trust comprehensive plan. Mr. McGovern. Yes, the proposal is to add one sentence. Uh, to the section of the personnel code uh, pertaining to health insurance, which would merely say employees have the option of choosing between the uh, Maine Municipal Employees Health Trust Comprehensive Plan and the Maine Municipal Employees Health Trust Comprehensive Point of Service Plan. Uh, there's also proposed to eliminate a little language in here that is, is antiquated in terms of, uh, I know it was written before a certain policy went into effect. Now that policy is going into effect, the effective dates are eliminated, but obviously the policy stays in place. Uh, this was offered by the, by the Maine Municipal Employees Health Trust uh, beginning January 1 of 1996. Uh, we had a meeting at which the uh, staff was invited to on this, uh, a meeting with representative of the Maine Municipal Employees Health Trust with the Personnel Advisory Committee. Uh, the Personnel Advisory Committee has approved the offering of this. It does uh, save the town for those that opt into it 2% of the premium of the portion that the town pays as well as 2% of the portion that the employees pay. Uh, the uh, Cape Elizabeth Police Benevolent Association uh, had been invited to all of the uh, meetings at the, the Personnel Advisory Committee at which this was reviewed. Uh, the person who has been serving as the representative of the Cape Elizabeth Police Benevolent Association on the Personnel Advisory Committee is no longer employed by the town. Uh, I did uh, send a copy of this proposal to the attorney for the Cape Elizabeth Police Benevolent Association approximately a month ago asking that uh, he take it up uh, with the members of the association. Uh, as, I, as it was related to me by uh, a former president, I'm not sure if he's an officer of the association, but the new representative of the association on the Personal Advisory Committee, uh, the Cape Elizabeth Police Professional Police Benevolent Association has no objection to the town council amending the language to put this in. However, they currently advise their members until they receive more information not to accept the option of the Maine Municipal Employees Health Trust Comprehensive Point of Service Plan until they obtain more information. Uh, we are going to be having a representative of the MMEHT uh, down again to explain the options between the Comprehensive Plan, the Comprehensive Point of Service Plan. Uh, the Police Benevolent Association indicated they had no objection to us inviting their members to that presentation. So I would urge that you amend the <laughs> health insurance to uh, put this in there. Thank you. You've lost I have it. another question, Mr. McKinty. No <laughs> <laughs> <So> move. <laughs> Councilor Reed. Um, Madam Chairman, I move that we accept the proposal to amend the personnel code to offer employees the option, the option of participating in the point of service plan offered by the Maine Municipal Employees Health Trust. Specifically, Section 2, da excuse me, Section 3-2-10, Health Insurance. The town participates in the Maine Municipal Employees Health Trust Comprehensive Plan. Employees have the option of choosing between the MMEHT Comprehensive Plan and the MMEHT Comprehensive Point of Service Plan. Second. You don't want about the previous? Oh, actually, there's. Oh, you need to, yeah, with the deletion, I'm sorry. I was... Okay. Do, do you want the rest of them? Just the next pair. Just, just, just the class out. The same. We're eliminating. There's a couple of T's and, oh. T's and I's that need to be. In capital E's. Yeah. 
and that we delete the full cost of the insurance. Is that what you want stated in the motion? The full cost of the insurance premium for permanent employees and their eligible dependents is assumed by the town until January 1st, 1995, after which is deleted. Okay. Is there a second for that? Yes. Okay. Further discussion? All in favor? That's a 7-0. Item number 56, to consider the appointment of the Registrar of Voters and take any necessary action. Mr. McGovern, are you going to do this yes. since we're appointing Ms. Lane? I'll do this even though Ms. Lane recommended herself. <laughs> 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 it, it, it's standard in most communities these days that the town clerk uh, become the Registrar of Voters. The current state statute provides that the appointment may be for one year. Uh, there is pending legislation that provides that uh, that could be extended to an indefinite term. Uh, the wording on this, it is recommended that you appoint Deborah M. Lane as a registrar of voters to serve through May 12, 1997, or such later date as, as a successor may be chosen. Uh, this merely keeps, would keep her in place until she was replaced. It does, does not in any way give her any sort of tenure that she could ever use uh, uh, for uh, inappropriate purposes. Not that we'd worry about that. Second. Discussion. All in favor? You still have your job, Debbie. <laughs> Item number 157 to approve, to consider approving the warrant for the June primary and take any necessary action. Um, Ms. Lane? Thank you very much. I apologize that the warrant um, is not before you, although there is a faxed copy um, of what will be filled in when the warrant gets to me. Um, the June primary will be held Tuesday, June 11th uh, at the Cape Elizabeth High School Gymnasium from 7 a.m. until 8 p.m. There will be a list of state and county offices plus a referendum question. One thing I would like to note is that because there is a referendum question, although you may not be enrolled in a political party, you may come to the polls and vote on the referendum question if you are unenrolled. Um, beyond that, you must be enrolled in a political party. The Democrats, Republicans, Reform Parties, and Green Party members will be participating in the June primary. Um, so I would request that you authorize, oh, I'm sorry, the uh, hours of the registrar are here at Town Hall, Monday 7.30 to 5, Tuesday through Friday 7.30 to 4, and absentee ballots will be voted when time allows, beginning at 7 a.m until 8 p.m. each hour on the hour. And again, all these points here will be presented on the, the warrant to be posted for the public. And I would ask you to authorize the town clerk on behalf of the town council to sign the June 11, 1996 primary election warrant uh, when it arrives in my office. So moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor. Oh, excuse me, Councilor. I just wanted to read the bond issue question on there. I was unaware of it myself. And just for the public's information, the bond issue question states, do you favor a $4,905,316 bond issue for a statewide library information system? I'm not sure the town librarian would be glad to hear from you with questions on that. <laughs> Thank you. Since left. Okay, all those in favor? That's a 7 0. Item number 158 to consider a pr proposed lease at the service station at 314 Ocean House Road and take any necessary action, Mr. McGovern. Yes, thank you, Madam Chairman. This is a lease of the service station next door uh, to Stephen Murray. Uh, the rent would be continued at the same amount as last year, $800 per month. Uh, it would be a one-year lease. Uh, it is with the understanding and with the, the less uh, uh, lessee's knowledge that uh, it is possible that during the next year the town council may be considering other options for that property as was recommended by a recent report. Uh, that's why we are recommending we continue with a, just a one-year lease. Uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? It's a 7 0. On to item number 159 to consider a proposed emergency ordinance that would provide that building permits shall remain in effect 
without commencement of construction for one year instead of five months and take any necessary action? Mr. McGovern? Yes, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, I quite frankly was not aware until this past week that building permits were only in effect for five months uh, as of the, after the date that, that they were issued. I think, you know, apparently the reason for that is that, you know, once a building permit is issued, there's the sense that, you know, it'd, it'd be good to get the work started because you, you have different uh, uh, rules that change and, you, you know, people generally in the neighborhood might like to be understanding and knowing what is going on with a certain property. Uh, I became aware of, of this particular provision uh, primarily due to one project uh, in the community uh, that has been pending in the community uh, as early as 1978. Uh, there's, there was even a chronology that I saw that had some dates earlier than that, but in, in my reflection looking at the issue, the first key date was, uh, was 1978. Uh, the particular proposal that I'm, that I'm talking about is the Elizabeth Heights uh, Conduit Care Facility that is uh, proposed on Shore Road. And I think it's important in looking at this issue that we understand a little bit about the history of this project and you know, what it would mean and what it would result in if this particular uh, building permit uh, was allowed to expire as it is uh, currently scheduled to do so on June 22nd. 1996. Uh, this project uh, first came to the town in 1978, but at that point, I think as everyone is aware, our sewer plant did not have any capacity. There was a moratorium in effect, and nothing could be hooked up to the what was then the Southern Cape Elizabeth uh, treatment plant, uh, which was across the street on Sparrowing Gavin from the current one. Uh, the project then came uh, back to the town in November of 1986 when there was a pre-application conference uh, before the Cape Elizabeth Planning Board. On February 10, 1987, the Zoning Board, ably led at that time by our current council chairman, uh, reviewed this particular, reviewed a particular proposal at that point for 200 and something units uh, was, was the proposal at that point. And it was based on a definition in, within the zoning ordinance of home for the, home for the aged. The zoning board at that point felt that it was more, more of something called a multiplex uh, unit than a, than a home for the aged, and uh, in essence ruled that a conditional use under home for the aged uh, was not properly before the board, so did not really truly consider the proposal uh, after having findings of fact on February 10th of 1987. Uh, the following month, first Atlantic Corporation, the owner of the property, uh, came to the town council and requested proposed, proposed amendments to the zoning ordinance uh, requesting definitions and standards for congregate care housing. At that point in time, congregate care housing was a fairly uh, new uh, option for housing and the town zoning ordinance simply did not address it. Uh, there was a 23-month period uh, through which the Cape Elizabeth Planning Board, the Cape Elizabeth Ordinance Committee, and the Cape Elizabeth Town Council reviewed various standards for congregate care housing. Uh, there was a, a, I would say, probably about at least 15 meetings over that period of time at which this issue was discussed, and eventually the Town Council uh, did agree on proper standards, as, as the Council saw fit at that time for congregate care facilities and for the density that would be allowed therein. Uh, so on February 13, 1989, the Town Council approved uh, new language, which in essence permitted congregate care facilities. On March 9th of 1989, it, First Atlantic applied and received a, applied for and received a sewer connection permit and paid a fee at that time of $19,200. Uh, they then began a process of trying to get approval uh, through the Cape Elizabeth Planning Board uh, for the particular uh, proposal. Uh, this was in, in started off, you can see all these dates when times were booming. Uh, by the time they got their, their planning board approval, the economy had changed significantly and uh, a 60 unit facility was approved on January 22nd, 1991, uh, which, is, which is a very key date. Uh, on January 10, 1994, 
the town council reviewed a whole series of technical amendments to both the zoning ordinance and to the subdivision ordinance. These technical amendments had gone through a couple year review process again, and uh, amongst the many provisions within, within these amendments uh, was a provision that caused the approval of, of Elizabeth Heights to expire, which is the, the name of the, the uh, congregate care facility, to expire on January 22, 1995. It provided that anything approved prior to the enactment of these technical amendments uh, would only continue uh, in place for approximately one year from that date. So the approval would expire on, excuse me, on January 22, 1995, unless the planning board granted a one-year extension. The ordinance section provision 19210B4 is very, very clear that the planning board can grant one extension only to a site plan approval. They cannot grant any more than one. So, you know, some have suggested this issue but ought to go back to the planning board. Uh, that is, you know, not something that the ordinance allows unless, you know, you had an emergency ordinance that specifically provided for that. Uh, First Atlantic uh, did take the option of going to the planning board and asking for the one-year extension. Reviewing the correspondence at that time indicates that their financing had not been set up. They went back to the board on December 20th, 1994. The planning board granted an extension of one year uh, on the site plan approval, which went to January 22, 1996. On January 12th of 1996, after an exchange of letters, uh, the owner of the property and the, the apparent transfer of, to, a, to a new entity uh, applied uh, to the town for a building permit and paid a building permit application fee. Uh, that was granted the building permit uh, on January 22nd, 1996. However, the actual permit has yet to be given to the applicant uh, because it has been held in escrow by our town attorney uh, waiting for the, uh, the performance guarantee for the property to be uh, given to the town. The performance guarantee is, I don't remember the exact amount, but it's in the range of $450,000 that needs to be uh, guaranteed to the town, which you know, obviously does require uh, some financing to be in place. Uh, we received a, anyway, the, under provisions of the zoning ordinance 1942C, it indicates that construction must begin in five months uh, after when a site plan approval takes place. Uh, that is on June 22nd. 1996. You had received a letter which indicated it was May 22 of 90, 1996. Uh, we got out all the mathematicians of Cape Elizabeth and Portland and others, and we figured out that it's actually June 22, 1996. It's not May 22, 1996. Uh, on April 29, 1996, uh, approximately two weeks ago, uh, the owner's representative sent a, a letter to the town indicating that construction financing had still not been closed. Uh, they also g gave us a letter which you received in your packet indicating that they had applied for it uh, with, a, with an outfit, uh, house, uh, I remember the name, uh, National Health Investors Incorporated, which is a, uh, a REIT, uh, and they indicated that uh, at that time, back when they wrote on April 24th, to the Elizabeth Heights Limited Partnership that they were reviewing the application and had received some favorable view up to that point, but that it had not received final approval. Anyway, uh, when that came to us on April 29, 1996, uh, I was approached by the, the building inspector in, in terms of, well, well, what do we do about this? Uh, the concern I had was that, you know, how do we really deal with it? Some have suggested that Ernie could grant an extension well, both the town attorney and I looked at it as well as Ernie, and it was absolutely clear that the building inspector did not have any right at all to grant an extension. And that the, the so we're at this point now, the planning board couldn't grant an extension, and the building inspector couldn't. The only group then that could deal with it uh, would be the town council, the chief policy making uh, organization group of the town. Uh, so therefore, I asked, the town attorney's office to draft a proposed uh, emergency ordinance which would provide, which 
as drafted provides that any permit issued between January 1 of 1996 and the date upon, the, upon which the emergency ordinance would expire would be extended for one year. An emergency ordinance is in place for 90 days. So it's any, any permit that would be granted between January 1 of this year and 90 days after the enactment of any emergency ordinance. And that's what you're, you're considering this evening. I did speak today to the, uh, the financing sh source uh, that the applicant has applied to, which is an outfit called National Health Investors Incorporated. Uh, the conversation uh, looked into exactly what review the applicant had, the application it had up to this point, as well as where, when it might be approved or, or decision made, as well as get a little more background on, on this particular outfit since I had never heard of them. Uh, apparently, uh, this is the fourth largest real estate investment trust in the country. Uh, they currently have uh, loans out for uh, over a billion dollars. Uh, it is uh, listed on the New York Stock Exchange, uh, the particular company. So when we actually go to review the performance guarantee, and whether or not this outfit is, is something, an outfit we would accept a performance guarantee, there will be some information that we can look at. That was a concern that I had uh, when I first looked, looked at this particular issue. Uh, I spoke with David Jones, who's the Assistant Vice President for Development. He indicated that, you know, like many of us this time of year, if you've been upstairs at all, uh, they're just swamped with, with construction activity, uh, a lot going on right now this time of year. Uh, the, the point that they're in now is that they're, they're just so backed up that he's looking at permanent financing for projects that are already under construction. That's what his top priority is in reviewing the different applications that, that are before uh, before their particular credit committee and their board. Uh, he did indicate, nonetheless, that their credit committee had looked at this application and that everyone who had looked at it was, had a favorable view of granting the financing. Uh, he did indicate that uh, under the, the loan provisions that under federal law as well as their the particular code of ethics or whatever, and that, that's uh, a little bit of, I don't know if it's the code of ethics, those are my words. Uh, they have to go through due diligence, uh, any of you are familiar with, with that, through real estate transactions. And they're now going through the process of due diligence to be sure that this particular group is, is uh, something that they would truly want to fund. He indicated that uh, the application looks promising, but a closing would not likely occur until late June or mid-July. Uh, the provision of our ordinance provides that not only the performance guarantee needs to be in place, but that also construction needs to begin by the, ex by the date that the building permit expires. Again, the building permit expires on June 22, 1996. Uh, therefore, it is, it is very apparent that from what this gentleman told me, unless they obtained other financing, uh, that uh, this project under the provisions of our ordinance uh, would effectively die unless this council uh, tried some resolution to, to keep this project alive. And you know, the, the applicant could, could determine more appropriately uh, what is the particular situation. Uh, I do want to make a, a few other points. Uh, one is that this comes before you in this solution uh, as a staff initiative and not as a particular request of what the applicant asked for. The applicant asked for an extension. The staff addressed the way the extension could best be handled working with our attorney. We felt that it needed to be before the policymakers, and that, you know, some had suggested, you know, as I mentioned, that Ernie could just handle it. Well, you know, our attorney says he can't. It, it is squarely before uh, you folks to handle it. Uh, the applicant does, has, uh, well, actually, the person with the building permit, uh, the owner of the building permit, uh, has in fact paid a number of fees. They paid a building permit uh, back in January, as I mentioned, for $16,500. Uh, they also paid a sewer permit back in 1989 uh, for $19,200. 
So we, we therefore have already collected 35700 in different permit fees uh, from, from this particular property. Uh, we will have estimated tax revenue, and this is very estimated because the, the assessor determines value, but this is just looking at the building permit of about $72,000 per year uh, with very little cost to the town uh, in terms of, you know, that they aren't going to have kids in the school or whatever. Uh, the project also does provide for a new sidewalk along Scott Dye Road, and there were some pedestrian easements, that, that type thing in the back as well, which I want you to be aware of. Uh, I also did receive a phone call from the owner of the Viking Intermediate Care Facility in Crescent House today, uh, Ronnie Boutet, or Ronnie Boutet. I always pronounce it Boutet, but he pronounced it Boutet on the phone today. Uh, he uh, indicated that the Viking uh, is in support of this particular facility. They do believe it's necessary. Uh, they did indicate that, he did indicate that uh, you know, he was concerned that, you know, essentially say as it is, there were, there's certain rumors going around that, uh, you know, that this is going to be something other than it was. I did look into some of those rumors today. There doesn't seem to be any, any validity to them at all in terms of, you know, that, that somehow the financing might change and uh, that, you know, I couldn't track down any validity to that at all. It's just the rumors that sometimes start when issues are, are before this. I, uh, you know, we deal at the staff level with a lot of different issues, and you know, fortunately, we can handle most of them at the staff level. Uh, this one is, is one that I do think needs to come before you. When you look at the whole, you know, the summary of the chronology that I've given you, there's a longer chronology that just goes to 1989. It's three pages long. Uh, this project has been through an extensive review. It uh, there is a tremendous, tremendous amount of money invested in it. Uh, it is, it was a victim of, of a very serious economic downturn uh, back in the 90s. It has very admittedly had some trouble getting financing along the way. It looks like it's about to get financing now. Uh, my concern as, as town manager and looking at council goals over the years is, uh, you know, what is in the long-term best interest of the town in terms of, you know, protecting ourselves legally, looking at, you know, potential cost if things do happen or don't happen. You know, if, if this dies, uh, I would not be, looking at the amounts that folks have invested in this, it is obvious that there would likely be some litigation on this, particularly as a result of the fact that the technical amendments to the ordinance occurred after it was originally approved. Uh, that, that's a major, major point. The technical amendments occurred after it was approved. Uh, second, that, you know, even if the town, you know, the, the council said no to this or, or something similar to it, and you, uh, you know, eventually went to court and you won on it, the applicant would then likely come back with some sort of new proposal. I think as most of the council's aware, Subsequent to when this project was approved, there was some new wetland amendments approved, and this project could not happen uh, today as it happened when it was originally approved. If you know they go back to the planning board, the planning board reviews an application based on the new standards, we would very clearly have this is what the old was, this is what the new was. That you know, would be interesting, but it, I'm not so sure it's in the best interest of the community to so graphically have side by side a before and after when the courts are so fluid as they now are in takings issues. Uh, you know, the courts have had certain rulings up to now. You never know, as we have in past takings issues, by the time an issue is finally resolved and works its way through the Superior Court and Law Court, where court decisions may be at that particular point. Uh, so I, I do think that, you know, there's some real longer-term financial issues involved in the potential of a taking if, you know, they needed to reapply uh, later on. Plus, you know, not to mention the legal fees that would be involved in sorting through this whole thing. So I really do think uh, two things. One, it is in the best interest of the town uh, to, to do this and to move forward with it. Uh, and uh, I also think that uh, that it's important that the council do it, you know, in, in a fairly timely manner. Uh, you could delay it until the June meeting, 
But you know, really, none of the circumstances are going to be any different in June than they are today. Uh, I would like to say that there are at least, I think, four representatives here uh, of the owner of the property and the, the presumptive owner of the property uh, who is who's here to answer any questions you may have. And, uh, particularly, I see Chris Vaniotis in the office in the, uh, in the room, who's an attorney with Bernstein, Shura, Sawyer, and Nelson, who is prepared to address the issue of how does our provision for building permit extensions and uh, building permit lengths compare with other communities. So I've gone on much lengthier than I usually do, but I do think this is an important issue and uh, deserved uh, a full hearing. Thank you. Councilor Linnell. I'd like to thank the manager for his uh, 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 very uh, apt uh, presentation in the spirit of uh, moving this along <laughs> in a timely fashion. <laughs> No, I really mean that. Let's move it along then. Uh, I move that we adopt the emergency ordinance, uh, which would provide that building permits shall remain in effect without commencement of construction for one year instead of for five months. Second. Discussion. Councilor McGinty. Um, in order to have an emergency ordinance, you have to have a emergency, is that correct? And according to this, the emergency is that without the issuance of a building permit that adversely affects the property of the inhabitants of the town and therefore constitutes a public emergency affecting life, health, welfare, and property of the inhabitants. I'd like to know how not how this emergency ordinance affects the the life, health, welfare, and property of the inhabitants. Michael, why don't you just continue? Would you like me to address that? I, I know you're eager to. I not particularly, but uh, <laughs> yes, thank you, uh, Councilor McGinty, Madam Chairman. Uh, this is the standard language that is drafted by the attorney in, in order to be in conformance with the emergency ordinance provision of the Council Manager Charter of the Town of Cape Elizabeth. The issue involving uh, the public emergency affecting life, health, welfare, and property is, you know, essentially as I've outlined. Uh, how would it how it would affect the welfare of the community uh, in terms of if this issue does not go forward where we're in a we're in a legal morass uh, we uh, have potential long-term cost of litigation uh, more remote for for a taking but you know obviously the, that issue is there as far as property you know that's the welfare side the property <laughs> side uh, you know I I think we've we've discussed that enough. Do you need any, you know, perhaps the applicant, or the the building permit holder might want to amplify more on that. Council McGinney. I'd like to hear from our legal counsel to see how he feels about this. Um, you've you know related a lot of issues regarding potential litigation, um, but perhaps we need to sit down um, and consult with him. As we often do with issues regarding land issues, um, and find out exactly where we stand legally on this. And, you know, with all due respect um, to your legal knowledge, um, I would prefer to hear from the, the direct from the town attorney. And um, also, I have another thing. I, I noticed that there's a member of the planning board in the audience, and I don't know if we might want to receive any information from the planning board or from a planning board member regarding this issue, if she cares to have you shall let you all make some comment, but I, I just want to make a comment because I think we're getting off the path. This um, amendment as proposed was when we thought the um, building permit would expire this month. That was part of the, the emergency situation. It also deals with every single permit that's been issued since January 1st and that will be issued for the next 90 days. Um, I, I think the emergency status of it has been um, removed since the expiration date is now June 22nd, that we could pass it as even an amendment specific for this particular issue, and it takes effect in 30 days. So the extension would be allowed as of June 30th, which would still cover them and still give them their extension until the next January. Um, I had a problem with this when I first, when Michael first proposed it, just the idea it's so broad. He did talk with a town attorney who didn't have any problems, and he's the one that ultimately drafted this proposal, and we can amend it whichever way we want. Um, 
So I was, that, those are the two issues. Number one, the emergency situation has been um, released a little bit because now it's another month before it expires. Number two, we can make it specific to this particular issue. Um, Michael made reference to other towns um, building permits and what is done. That problem has, is being addressed by the zoning ordinance rewrite where the building inspector is specifically given the power to extend a building permit for another six months. Um, that's not going to relieve this particular situation. So um, I don't know if any of the councilors are concerned about the overall width of this proposal, how broad it is, or the emergency situation. If you want to make a comment to that, Councilor Leno. Yeah, I, I think when, if you have, whenever you're trying to get anything done, uh, there's, there's enough limitations to it. I think uh, five months is a kind of a tight window for, for a lot of projects, whether it's a, a project of the size of this or if it's somebody trying to build a house. And, and so I think uh, uh, giving someone a, a year uh, uh, to act uh, on construction with all the complications and financing for anyone is reasonable. I just assume government got out of the way and let them go ahead. I don't think it's going to hurt. I mean, I, I just think a year is reasonable. If they, if they meet everything, give them a year to do it. Thank you. Uh, Councilor McLaughlin, you have your hand up. I'll pass for the time being. I'm still thinking again. <laughs> well, is there anyone from the public who wants to make a comment at this point while we um, seem to be cogitating up here? If you just come to the microphone, please, and give me your name and address. Thank you, Madam Chairman and members of the Council. My name is Chris Vaniotis, and I'm legal counsel for Elizabeth Heights, uh, excuse me, Elizabeth Housing Limited Partnership, uh, uh, who would like to be the developer of this project, who is contemplating uh, buying the property and the project from Cape Elizabeth Realty Trust, uh, which the manager has referred to as First Atlantic Corporation, uh, who has been working on this project for a number of years. I, I hesitate to say much because the manager did such a thorough explanation that I don't want to repeat what he had to say, but I would like to give you a few uh, additional points from the perspective of the would-be developer of the project. Uh, the first thing I want to say, and, and I hesitate to disagree with the manager at all, but I, I want to make it clear to, to the council that we don't see litigation resulting from this project. Uh, it's not the goal of Elizabeth Housing Limited Partnership to get into a fight with the town. Uh, so, so I, I just want you to understand that we never said anything to the manager which suggested that we'd be in court fighting you over this if the council doesn't do this tonight, and we hope nothing like that is going to have to happen. I think the only issue that we could conceivably see is if the council doesn't take legislative action tonight with an amendment, we may end up in a position where we would have to make a formal application to the building inspector to extend the permit in order for the building inspector to tell us, no, you can't, and then maybe take that to the Board of Appeals and see whether a, a court might find some implied authority to extend the building permit. But as the manager suggested, uh, the council is really the body who could deal with this with a legislative solution and, and avoid any of that. Uh, and we're in a somewhat unusual position because this is not our proposal. This proposal did indeed come from staff. Uh, Elizabeth Housing Limited Partnership went to the code officer and said, can we get an extension? And then code officer said, no, I don't think you can. And that's when staff became involved. And we were, needless to say, tickled pink when we got a call from staff and from the manager's office saying, you know, we think we may have a solution by dealing with this at the town council level. So we're in the position of being uh, maybe the lightning rod or the, the catalyst or the precipitating factor, but, but not really the initiators, at least, of this proposed amendment. I do want to suggest to you that this, as, as Councilor Linnell has suggested, is really a change which makes sense even if this particular project weren't in this time crunch right now. And, and something which, as, as uh, the Chairman indicated, is probably going to be addressed in, in the upcoming draft of the zoning ordinance uh, so that there will be a provision that allows the building inspector to extend the building permit once one has been issued. The, uh, the time crunch that we're in is, we respectfully suggest, the emergency. So maybe we're not the need for the ordinance, but, but we're the emergency. And candidly, 
cut this off and enact it as a normal ordinance effective in June is going to leave us in the same circumstances of trying to talk to construction lenders without being to tell those construction lenders that we will have a project for them to finance uh, until the town council has taken some action here. The manager did indicate that uh, I talked to you a little bit about what other towns do. I well, spent a lot of your time doing this, but I did go through some zoning ordinances which I happen to have on my desk today, and I see a lot of them in the course of my work. Just for some examples, the Freeport zoning ordinance allows one year and also allows an extension for an additional year. Uh, these are primarily towns we represent. That's how I happen to have them in the office. South Berwick is a one-year period. Winthrop is a one-year period with three years to complete. Yarmouth is a one-year period, and the permit may be renewed without charge for a second 12-month period. Uh, Guam has no start date at all, but has an 18-month completion date for building permits. And then it goes on to say that the building permit may be renewed without charge upon application if it's not done within the 18 months. Scarborough has a six-month period, but they also allow an extension for an additional six months. Uh, the five months in Cape Elizabeth is really unique. I've, in about 15 years of zoning practice, I've never seen one quite as short as the five months. So what we're suggesting to the council is that the action you might take tonight, although you do it on an emergency basis because this particular project is in a bind, is something that would make some sense anyway and wouldn't, wouldn't be only for this project because tonight it happens to be us. Um, it could be anybody caught by that five-month period without a provision for an extension in the ordinance. Um, let me tell you just a little bit about why this particular project finds itself in these circumstances. And the manager gave you a very thorough chronology. The, uh, the applicant for the original approval from the planning board in 1991, First Atlantic Corporation, was very cooperative with the planning board in terms of designing uh, a beautifully finished and landscaped project, um, one which has turned out to be very expensive to build, frankly. The site improvements alone, as the manager indicated, total uh, $467,000. That's landscaping and basic site work like sidewalks and roadways for what is basically a single building project. Uh, it has $88,000 of landscaping in it as part of the planning board conditions of approval. $66,000 for roads and sidewalks, again, for a single building. The reason we're telling you this is that the bind it puts this applicant in is that what we've ended up with is a project that is really a kind of high-end, uh, I hesitate to use the word luxury, but it's going to be a very upscale kind of facility and all the units will be market rate units, and none of them are going to be subsidized in any fashion by any governmental agency. Now that has cut out for First Atlantic Corporation uh, for several years some of the traditional sources of financing for elderly housing projects. The U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, the Maine Health and Higher Education Facilities Authority, are not interested in financing this kind of a project. They'll do subsidized things, but they won't do this kind of a project. And where that leaves Elizabeth Housing Limited Partnership is exclusively in the private market for financing this project. Um, Elizabeth Housing Limited Partnership has filed 16 financing applications since they became involved in July. Several of them are still out there pending, and the one that has the most promise at this point is the one that uh, the manager referred to from the National Health Investors, Inc. Real Estate Investment Trust. And it looks like that's going to happen and will be happening in late June or early July. But if the building permit expires in June, then it's simply too late for that to happen. Um, so we're hoping the council will take some action tonight to put us in a position where we can continue down that road of talking to the financing entities the um, uh, client tells me that, frankly, local people are not going to finance this project because it's so big. It's a $3.3 million building alone. So they're out on the national market, and it takes longer to persuade folks who are located in, and I should remember the address of the uh, National Health Investors, but I, somehow I think Oklahoma or someplace like that. It takes a little bit longer to persuade them of the viability of a project in Cape Elizabeth, Maine, than it would if we were talking to a local bank. 
But, <coughs> excuse me, Elizabeth Housing Limited Partners are convinced that this is a good project. It can be financed and it will go. That uh, it's a good project for the town. It's going to be 60 units of congregate housing, pure congregate housing in the sense that it's not a nursing care facility, it's not assisted living, but it will be housing for elderly persons who are capable of living independently with some limited services available to them should they need them. Um, Cape Elizabeth, uh, excuse me, Elizabeth Housing Limited Partnership is confident that there's a need for the project and that it will be occupied once it's financed and up and running. Uh, the manager has already told you about the tax benefits to the town and we think those are significant. Uh, if this kind of a project doesn't happen on this property, probably what will happen at some point is some kind of a residential subdivision, which uh, is in many respects a higher impact project for the town and certainly wouldn't have the tax benefits of this, this type of a project. Um, an easement is going to the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust for a pedestrian trail to connect with some existing trails on, on abutting properties. Uh, a new sidewalk on Scott Dyer Road is one of the amenities that goes with the project. The reason I'm listing all these is just to try to persuade you that there are some benefits in this project for the town and uh, it's not just us, it's the town that would get some benefit from eliminating this five month restriction and giving us that additional time to work. We're not trying to subvert the planning board in any way. This project is past the planning board. We're now, now in the building permit stage. And again, it's the five months without any opportunity for extension in your current zoning ordinance that right now is standing in the way of this project. We very much appreciate staff coming up with a solution, and we hope the council will see it as a, as a good solution. Um, I can answer any questions you may have. In addition, Marsha Brown and Kevin McCarthy from Elizabeth Housing Limited Partnership is here. And uh, Dan Hurahan from First Atlantic Corporation is also here. Uh, he goes back probably to close to 1978 with this one, Dan. Quite a few years, anyway. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Any questions from the council? That we saw another hand. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Janet McKay. Nine Wood Road, and I appreciate the opportunity to address the council. I am a currently a member of the planning board, but I do want to make it clear right up front that I am not speaking for the planning board here. I'm simply speaking as a private citizen. You've been asked tonight to improve an emergency ordinance extending the building permit from five months to 11 months. Uh, the town manager has certainly done a very thorough job of uh, extending the chronology of this project, so I won't certainly repeat that. Um, I, I just simply, my concern here is to hope that the council really understands the context in which the emergency ordinance is to be considered. My uh, participation, or I guess connection with the project, started back in 1990, not at the beginning, but in 1990. I was a member of the planning board, which uh, uh, considered the project, considered the citizens' concerns, considered the applicant's proposal, and I think I can truly say that the planning board uh, did a number of site walks, worked long and hard, the applicant worked long and hard, and the end result was a wonderful plan which the board approved on January the 22nd, 1991. Uh, I want to make very clear that I have no objection to the project whatsoever. My concern here tonight is one of procedure. The planning board approved this site plan for a one-year period. It was up January of 1992. The applicant came in and requested an extension for another year. The planning board granted it. The applicant came in in January of 93 and requested a second one-year extension. At that point, at least one planning board member suggested that um, maybe we should have an end to this at some point, that the whole idea of granting one-year approvals for site plans was to encourage any applicant, frankly, to get its act together, uh, present what it wanted to do to a planning board, get that approval, and go ahead and produce the project. Uh, there are reasons why the planning board time limitations are in there and why zoning limitations are in. So in, as 
as uh, the town manager has suggested, uh, and by the way, I also uh, don't uh, lightly disagree with the town manager, but I did feel compelled to uh, stand up in this instance. Um, in January of 94, the town council in its technical amendments provided that any site plan approval that was outstanding at that point was good for a one-year period until February the 1st of 95. So now we have four years for this project in terms of approval. The applicant came back in January of 95 and requested another one-year extension, the only extension which the planning board could grant at that point under the revised amendments that had been passed in 1994. The planning board, after some discussion, granted that extension. So now we're good until January of 96. We've had a full five-year ride on something that was approved a year at a time. In the fall of 1995, the applicant notified the town that uh, it might have some trouble um, pulling the building permit by January of 1996, and the town, to its credit, really uh, bent over backwards to enter into an escrow agreement with the applicant so that the building permit could be issued on January the 22nd, 1996, the absolute last day on which it could be issued, but it was held in escrow. It was held in escrow pending the completion of all of the conditions which the planning board had put on back in 1991, conditioning the issuance of the building permit. Now we get down to April the 29th and all of a sudden there's a quote unquote emergency. It's just hard for me to understand that this is truly an emergency. Now I certainly don't want to interfere with the policy and uh, that the town may decide to adopt in terms of the um, encouragement of this particular project. But what I do want the town to understand is that there are particular reasons why there are time limitations in ordinances and there is something that seems a little out of line to try to bend the existing rules which have been in existence for quite a while to the um, to, to favor a particular applicant. Um, I think uh, that finally I'd like to address the concerns which, the, uh, which are included in the cover memo to you in consideration of this ordinance. The first of the issues which apparently is under uh, some difficulty of resolution is the status of previously paid building permits and sewer connection fees. I assume that it wouldn't take uh, seven rocket scientists to figure out what to do with that if you decided to not grant the extension. The second uh, something that's mentioned is the applicant would need to go through site plan approval again to renew the project if indeed you did not extend the building permit. And that indeed is what every applicant would have to do if its building project, a building permit expired. Um, finally, there is the mention which the town manager has made of a potential taking. I was glad to hear uh, Mr. Vaniotis uh, indicate that the applicant has certainly not threatened any um, litigation here. Uh, this whole um, process of the emergency ordinance did not come to my attention until last Thursday, and when it did, it came by a very, uh, really a fluke, actually. Um, but I was concerned enough to call the town attorney and find out if there was some, uh, something that I was missing about this particular uh, series of circumstances. And I'd certainly invite you to have your own conversation with, with Michael Hill, but uh, I will report to you that he did tell me on Thursday in response to a question of mine that uh, he knew of no reason to treat this particular expiration of a building permit any differently from any other expiration of a building permit. I think the, uh, the town has certainly given the applicant every, the benefit of the doubt. Uh, there certainly is perhaps more money I involved here than in the um, expiration of other building permits, but 
I guess the question is whether uh, applicants, regardless of money, uh, have to play by the rules. So thank you very much. Council McLaughlin. Could I ask some questions, please, Ms. McKay? Um, you said initially that you were not speaking as a planning board member. However, you alluded very frequently to planning board action and some of the actions that you, a general resident, would not be fully aware of. So I do have to take some of your comments as your membership on the planning board. And in light of that, I would like to ask how you voted um, on this. I'm pretty sure I voted in favor of it. I mean, I didn't go back to look at the uh, okay. to, to look at the project, but I meant to say that in my in my comments. I'm I'm almost positive I voted for it because I certainly do think it's a wonderful project. Well, I just think that needs to be stated. I'm also, if you were speaking only as a private citizen, under what auspices did you have reason to contact the town attorney? That's not usually done by private citizens. I understand that to be the case, and I uh, guess this came to my attention um, a Wednesday night, and I called uh, the chairman of the council on Thursday to see if there was some uh, something that I might be missing, and I asked her whether she had any objection to my calling the town attorney, recognizing that it was not usually done. But I myself am an attorney, and I have spoken with Michael Hill on a number of occasions and have dealt with him on business other than town business. So I, I told the chairman that uh, if she had no objection, I might call the attorney, but I would keep it short and not run up the town's bill. And indeed, that's, that's what I did. Okay, thank you. Councilor Reed. I would like uh, to know how many $3.3 .3 million projects uh, have been approved in this town. I think money makes and the scope of the project uh, certainly has a bearing for me. And um, I also am um, pleased that the uh, Zork rewrite has uh, corrected the omission of an application extended extension period. And the ordinance has been changed from five to six months. Is that correct? And then a six-month extension. Um, I think we have addressed the fact um, in a roundabout way that a year is a more appropriate time. Um, I do think that, is that correct, sir? $3.3 million is the scope of this. I apologize. $3.3 million is just the construction cost of the building. Uh, site work is at least $477,000, so the project is, is getting up to the $4.5 million range. I, I do um, personally think that there are obvious benefits to this project. Uh, I've been watching it, uh, not with the intensity of some, but uh, for more than 10 years. Um, I am very open to being flexible on this project. I think it benefits the people of this town. Um, people who may uh, not stay in town if such a facility were not available. I do think the viability of the project would be affected if there were not the strength of a, an approval of an extension um, by the town council. I think creditworthiness and the uh, environment that the attorney um, suggested um, could either make or break whether or not this project goes. And I think the feasibility of this project uh, ending in completion uh, could be based on how we vote tonight, and I will vote to support uh, the emergency ordinance uh, if it's for this project alone or if it is for um, all of the uh, permits that have been issued since January 1st of 1996. I would also like a clarification and three months forward. Uh, five of us need to vote in favor of this for this to be approved. Is that correct? Thank you. Councilor Jordan, were you raising your hand? No, I wasn't, but I, I'm going to, I would like to speak in favor of this project, and I feel the extension should be granted, and I also would like to have it very clearly understood that this would be the last extension of this sort that I would vote in favor of. Councilor McGindy. Well, I guess money talks, if that's what's going to happen here. But I'd still like to either table this to the next month's meeting um, and talk with our attorney. That's what I think needs to be done. 
Other comments? Councillor um, McLaughlin. I'm glad I took some time to do some thinking, and Mr. Danny Otis answered one of the questions I was pondering when the chairman proposed that perhaps we could do this as a regular ordinance and have it go into effect in 30 days. I was glad to have you clarify the impact that would have on the financial situation. That's what I needed to hear. I deal with very large projects on a somewhat more regular basis than is dealt with by the review boards in Cape Elizabeth. I'll cite one national semiconductor for an example. I know what it is like for the developer to run into financial <coughs> snags. I am not going to hold this project hostage because they are having trouble right now with the financial situation. That happens. That is reality. I think we have to be flexible. I am very glad to hear what is coming forth from the Zork Committee with basically a one-year building permit, although be it in two parts, and I'm going to vote in favor of the emergency ordinance. Any other comments? Otherwise, I said earlier, the emergency is not as serious as was first presented to us. In order to have an effective change in the ordinance without going through our usual process, which would mean that we'd refer it to the planning board, and it would take probably anywhere to th possibly four or five months to have it amended. So that enacting it as an emergency ordinance is the only way for us to deal with this particular um, project. I, too, am in favor of the cyber project. I'm sure it complements the existing um, elderly care facility that is adjacent to it. However, I still don't think we need it. Um, if we have a problem that can be solved by um, this particular dealing, tailoring to this particular project, it would be the same as using a match in, um, when a match would work instead of using a nuclear reactor plant. So I would, I would prefer to have this, <laughs> have this committed more to this specific project instead of all building permits. But if there are no further um, discussion on this item or anyone from the audience who wants to make a comment, all those in favor of the motion is presented. Did we Takes five. Do, do a roll call vote for emergency ordinance, please. Councilor Chapel? Yes. Councilor Jordan? Yes. Councilor Linnell? Yes. Councilor McGinty? Abstain. Excuse me? Abstain. You should vote one way or the other. I think I can make up my mind how to vote. Thank you. <laughs> Councilor McLaughlin? Yes. Councilor Reed? Yes. Chairman Coxall? Yes. We have a six, six one. Six zero. Six zero one. So this is, is clear that there would just be this one extension that um, you do have until January to begin significant uh, construction of the project. Thank you very much. We never breathed would take up half your time tonight. <laughs> well, we want to make sure we have a thorough discussion. It's, it's, it's quite a precedent-setting issue. So. Thank you all. On to yeah. item number 160, which is to enter um, into executive session. Right. Yeah, I'm a good citizen. Good. Citizen discussion? Right. Citizen, I'm using my wrong page here. <laughs> citizen discussion period and items not on the agenda. Is there anyone who wishes to make a comment in any other subject? There being now, we'll go on to item 160 to consider entering into executive session to discuss matters of land acquisition disposition and take any necessary action. And I'll say that um, we will not be coming back before the cameras that we will adjourn after we come out of executive session. Um, Second. Thank you very much. You've done that really well tonight. See you Monday night.